like a lot of you, I keep watching the news every day, keep watching these horrific videos of unarmed black people being shot by the police, by rising waves of bigotry against refugees and immigrants, and poverty in levels that we haven't seen before. It's hard to not feel like the very fabric of our social experiment is coming undone. We have just wrapped up a nasty election year with the victory of Donald Trump running on the theme that he's going to make America great again. When I take a good and long, hard look at us, it doesn't feel like we're doing so great. I want us to have this difficult conversation about the greatness of America by keeping track of two communities who today find themselves under assault and vulnerable, black Americans and Muslim Americans. This conversation is not abstract, it's not theoretical, it's deeply personal for me. It's about my babies and your babies. It is about Yusur, Razan, and Dia, three beautiful, committed American citizens of Muslim background who did everything right. They worked for social justice in our inner cities. They connected that struggle to the suffering of people halfway around the world and yet they were shot and killed in cold blood in the safety of their own apartment. Less than 24 hours after they were killed, our university asked me to stand in front of 10,000 students and somehow comfort them by telling them that this is still their home. What are we supposed to do when you're not safe in your own home? What does it mean to speak about the greatness of America when for so many of us, this country doesn't feel safe? I wanna take us back a little bit to the funeral that we recently celebrated of the great Muhammad Ali. Not just great, the greatest of all time. Muhammad Ali, who was the heavyweight champion of the world back when boxing was king, Muhammad Ali, who was the most famous person on the planet, Muhammad Ali, who was big and brash and poetic and, oh my God, so beautiful. And he would be the first to tell you just how pretty he was. Muhammad Ali, who was hip hop, before the word existed, and Muhammad Ali who made the same connection that I'm asking us to make here today, of the connection between the struggle against racism here at home to the struggle against militarism abroad. We celebrate Muhammad Ali today, he was not celebrated in his own lifetime. Our government, took away the heavyweight championship belt from him for three and a half years. Why? Because he refused to go fight in a war that he considered unjust. He said, and famously, why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs. This is the context that I want us to have a conversation about our greatness, a greatness that perhaps has to be built in our future and not look to in our past. I'm gonna start with my own community, Muslims. Virtually everything that is said about Muslims is framed in the context of ISIS. And let us not mince words. ISIS is a savage, barbaric, and brutal 
force of destruction, the dogs of hell, we call them. We should know because we as Muslims are the primary victims of ISIS. Whether it is in Iraq, in Syria, in Bangladesh, in Istanbul, in Medina, and also in Brussels and Paris, we see the brutality of ISIS everywhere. The question that I want to ask is a reminder from the late and great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who tells us, few are guilty, all are responsible. What is our responsibility about ISIS? Yes, we will denounce ISIS with our last breath. When, as Americans, are we going to have a discussion about our collective role in having created the political instability in Iraq through illegally invading that country in 2003? Until we invaded Iraq, there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and of course, there was no ISIS. President Obama has asked us, and rightly so, particularly for Muslim communities, to denounce ISIS. What does it mean when every single significant scholar and institution and community from Muslim societies continues to denounce ISIS, but the rest of us sometimes act like we're stuck in some bad cell phone commercials? Can you hear us now? Is it that Muslims are not speaking, or is it that we are not listening? What does it mean when our great scholars unanimously denounce ISIS, even the great Hamza Youssef, arguably the most credible of American Muslims, and we can't get a single mainstream corporate media source to come and cover this? But on the other hand, on those rare occasions, like San Bernardino and the assault on the LGBT club in Orlando, when a Muslim commits an act of violence, we have wall-to-wall -wall coverage. ISIS comes to America. What is it about Islam that produces violence like this? Well, we have daily mass shootings in America. Someone like a Dylan Roof walks into the historic Amy Church in Charleston, shoots and kills nine unarmed black worshipers after having put up a manifesto online, I hate black people. Yet there is no collective conversation that we have in which we ask the question, what is it about the culture of white supremacy? that produces mass shooters like this on a daily level. Let's come back to the presidential cycle that we find ourselves. This thing, <laughs> whatever this is, it's like watching the comment section of YouTube come to life and run for the highest office on the planet. Now speaks about, now, we shouldn't really be clapping. We should be weeping and mourning what has happened to our democracy. He talks about shutting down mosques, shutting down Muslim immigration to America, speaks about Islam hates us, as if Islam is this thing, this person that wakes up in the morning, brushes his teeth, and goes about hating Americans. And of course, one thing that we know, the minute that a person closes their heart to one block of humanity, they rarely stop at one. Hate is contagious. So now we see him speaking in the same way about Mexicans as being rapists, about physically disabled people, women's rights groups, poor people, and so on. And here's where I really want us to grapple with this question. Are we great? We are left with this corrupt, sold-out, two-party system where one person is telling us that he's going to make America great again. And the counterpart responds by saying, no, we're not going to make America great again. America has always been great. 
will we have the decency and the moral courage to stand up and say, when we committed genocide against Native American people, we were not great. When slavery was legal in this country for 245 years, we were not great. When we had Jim Crow and Jane Crow, we were not great. The way that we treated Irish and Jews and Hispanics and women in this country was not great. And when we have daily police shooting of black and brown people in this country, we are not great. A country that sees 20% of its children living in poverty is not great. I love this country. I ache for what we have become. I so desperately want us to become great. But we are not great. What do we have to say at a time when President Donald Trump chooses as his main advisor a person, Steve Bannon, who had overseen a platform, Breitbart, which is dedicated to a white supremacist ideology and whose choice was applauded by the KKK and the American Nazi Party. Are we a great nation when President Trump and his first appointees advocate a national registry for Muslims, mass deportation of Hispanics, undoing Affordable Health Care Act, dismantling what is left of our public education, and increasing militarism abroad. Is this how a great nation behaves towards the weak and vulnerable in her own borders and abroad? Let's shift the focus away from the individual politicians. In a sense, all that they have done is to mirror and amplify the racism and the xenophobia that's been part of our legacy. As other people have said it before, let us remember that in America, the lynching of black people is legacy, is tradition. Oftentimes, the people that we see who are targeted are the people who stand out as being visibly other. Muslim women wearing head covering. Our Sikh brothers wearing a turban. And perhaps no place and no time do we see the discrepancy of this demon of white supremacy that keeps us from being great more vividly than the juxtaposition. The daily assault on black bodies in our cities, you know their names. Michael Brown, Tamar Rice, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, and just recently, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile. Black people being killed by the very police force sworn to honor, serve, and protect them. And on the other hand, you've got white militias showing up with semi-automatic weapons, white militias that oftentimes have a KKK or white separatist leaning, demonstrating in front of mosques and Islamic centers, or taking over federal buildings. And the police responds not by shooting them, but by, by saying, we must exercise caution and discretion. I don't want our white brothers and sisters to be killed and shot, but I have to ask the question, what does a white militia have to do to be treated the way that our black and brown brothers and sisters are treated every day? on our streets. That discrepancy has a name, and that name is white supremacy, and that is what keeping us from being the great nation that we think we are. If you don't want to take my word for it, go to the Southern Poverty Law Center, which maps out hate groups across the country, 892 neo-Nazi, KKK, neo-Aryan groups spreading like measles across the country. This is the reality of who we are. Let's connect as Ali connected 
the racism at home to the militarism abroad, we spend more on our military than the next 12 countries combined. We are spending hundreds of billions of dollars to build this empire, this military industrial complex, which is killing and subjugating brown bodies, primarily Muslim bodies, overseas. And now, that same war-grade machinery is being recycled back into our inner cities to police and subjugate primarily black and brown bodies. This is Ferguson. And this war-grade machinery is what's patrolling our inner cities. This is the context in which we have an emergence of a Black Lives Matter movement with a simple demand, stop killing black people. This is where our people of color find themselves confronting a militarized police force. Over there is now over here. And that's why sometimes you have to look long and hard to figure out which scene is Ferguson and which scene is Gaza in Palestine. The same tear gas is used on both communities. But I'm not going to leave us in an abyss of despair and hopelessness. If I rebel against what we have become, it is because deep in my heart, I do believe that greatness is an option for us as a people. The answer begins with solidarity. It shows up when we are willing to link together our resistance and our struggle by saying, I cannot be who I want to be until you be everything that you ought to be. It happens when you see Muslim sisters showing up in Ferguson, marching arm in arm, with our African-American sisters and brothers, the answer is love. But love not as this hokey, commercialized, commodified, thingified emotion for Valentine's Day Hallmark cards. Love as that redemptive divine force that disrupts, transforms, and uplifts. I will stand with you because I love you. We saw this love on display in Muhammad Ali's funeral as a person of color, as a Muslim who has felt like America doesn't feel like my home in the last 15 years. In Ali's funeral, I saw an America that I want to belong to. And I know that that America, that great America, is not in our past. That America is not our present. If we want to live in that great America, we have to build it. It's an America that we have to become. And we have echoes of this in our founding documents. We, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. Thank God it doesn't say that we are a perfect union. We weren't perfect during slavery. We weren't perfect during Jim Crow. We're not perfect today. But if we can reach out, hold hands, resist and struggle together, we can build this more perfect America. I'm going to give the last word to the great bard of Harlem, Langston Hughes, and his beautiful, majestic poem, Oh, yes. I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs>